Here we're looking at the animal phylum Platyhelminthes. Platyhelminthes. Kind of a mouthful to say there, and I do my best to kind of give you an indication of how to pronounce that. I'll refer to it in the video as kind of solid or flatworms. They kind of look like this. Very simple, but we're getting slightly more complex if you're watching these videos in sequence. So first off, solid or flatworms, they have bilateral symmetry. So this body symmetry differs. This bilateral symmetry means that only one plane can cut through the organism in half to produce mirror images. So we see the example here of the butterfly, and here also of the fern. This is bilateral symmetry. There's a distinct left and right half. Same here, a distinct left and right half. And these flatworms have this type of symmetry. Different than some of the organisms we talked about previously, this allows for a greater degree of specialization to occur. Now, radial versus bilateral symmetry. So remember, radial symmetry, regular arrangement of parts around a central axis. With these having evidence of bilateral symmetry, they have a distinct right and left halves to form the mirror image. With these right and left halves, we have a little bit more um, detail we can go into when we're talking about an animal. And we want to talk about dorsal versus ventral. These are terms gonna, I'm going to use um, we get into body systems also. So the dorsal side versus the ventral side. Dorsal side, you can see the fish is up here. And uh, here, think of the dorsal fin of a dolphin. The ventral is the underside here, and that's the ventral side of the fish. Anterior and posterior. So anterior is towards the head, posterior is towards the tail in this case. So this would be the anterior portion here. This would be the posterior portion here where the tail is located. So just, again, some key terms you should be familiar with. Solid and flatworms, bilateral symmetry. The bilateral symmetry um, produces these three embryonic layers. Okay, in metazoans is the three different types of layers we're going to talk about. Now, initially, they might sound a little kind of weird, but I think it makes sense once you understand the terms. So, ectoderm will develop on the outer coverings of the body and nervous system. Ecto means external. Okay? Exterior, you can kind of think of it. Mesoderm will develop the skeleton and muscles. That's the middle layer. Mesoderm, referring to the middle layer here. And I referred it here to the human body in hopes that it can make a little bit better connection. So that ectoderm, the outer body coverings, think of that like our skin cells of our epidermis here. Mesoderm is those skeleton and muscles, getting our middle part. And endoderm, the internal layer, develops into digestive organs, such as our intestines. So while this is still, these three layers will still exist for solid and flatworms, even though they don't have these complex systems, hopefully connecting them to these common body systems that you're familiar with will help you remember ecto is on the outside, meso is in the middle, and endo is on the inside. In addition, solid and flatworms are the simplest of all bilateral symmetrical organisms. So yes, they're more complex than what we've talked about so far, but overall they are the most simple. They lack any internal cavity, other than a digestive tract, they are the simplest animal in which organs are found. These are called acetylomates. We see that in here. This is their gut region. This is their ectoderm. Here's their mesoderm here. And their endoderm would be their gut. And that's about it. This is what they look like. Very, very simple here. This is a real-world image of what they look like. Most flatworms are parasitic, though. Uh, but some are free-living. And flatworms range in size from less than a millimeter to many meters long. See, here's like a tapeworm. Extremely long. Others are very, very teeny tiny. Solid flatworms, they have actually gone through a process called degenerative evolution. Parasitic flatworms' lifestyles resulted in the eventual loss of features not used or needed by the parasite. Example, parasite flatworms don't need eye spots. The loss of features that lack adaptive purpose for parasitism is often called degenerative evolution. Think of them as like gaining features and then not using them and then kind of losing them. Uh, over time. It's kind of evolution kind of going backwards simply because those advancements are not needed. It's an example, a close-up of a tapeworm. Tapeworms are a classic example of this degenerative evolution. The body of a tapeworm has been reduced to two primary functions, simply eating and reproducing. That's it. They don't need any other specialized features. They're just consuming food and they're reproducing. Kind of a little bit of how they look in the inside of a body, inside of an intestine system here. And in a close-up. Now, solid flatworms have an incomplete gut. This means flatworms have a digestive cavity. They have an incomplete gut with only one opening. So, hopefully, you're not eating during this uh, video here. But the gut branches throughout the body, as you see here, 
is involved in both digestion of food particles and also the excretion of waste of the same area. These parasitic flatworms lack a gut entirely and absorb food directly through their body walls. There's a simple system. They lack a um, circulatory system, and all the cells must be within diffusion distance of oxygen in food. This is why they're flat, that great surface area to volume ratio. And they have a very basic and simple nervous system also. Free living forms have eye spots, as you see here, that can distinguish light from dark. So it's inaccurate to call these eyes. They're just eye spots because they're just sensing light or dark. Lastly here, gastrovascular cavity is not a complete digestive system. So in the flatworm, it has a gastrovascular cavity with one opening that serves as both a mouth and an anus. The excretory system is made up of these tubes connected, and the nervous system is composed of interconnected nerve cords running the length of the body. Remember, it's very simple, though. And all to get that food from the central gut region to any of its cells, they all have to be within diffusion distance for that to occur.